Staph aureus is our coagulase and catalase positive gram positive cocci. Remember that Staph aureus has protein A. Do you remember what protein A does? It binds to IgG and prevents activation of complement and decreased production of C3B. This is used in opsonization. So what do you think of when you read a question that says, a bunch of people at a picnic develop vomiting and watery diarrhea? I'm hoping you're saying Staph aureus preformed toxin. It is the most common cause of food poisoning referred to as the 24-hour bug. Ingestion of the preformed enterotoxin produces nausea and vomiting, usually within six hours. And it tends to resolve within about a day. The classic question you'll see is, they'll give you a history of a picnic with potato salad, sandwiches, and other mayonnaise-containing foods. And all these foods have been sitting out for a while, as foods tend to do at a picnic. Many of you will see this question, so be ready to treat your patient conservatively and make the correct diagnosis. You will also encounter MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, with increasing frequency in your medical center, both in the community and in the hospital. When you suspect a staph aureus skin infection or wound infection, it is safer to treat the infection with an antibiotic that is active against MRSA while you wait for culture and susceptibilities to return. Vancomycin is a commonly used antibiotic against MRSA, but you will learn more about this in the antimicrobial section. As we talk about in the basic microbiology lecture, remember that Staph aureus can also cause toxic shock syndrome as a result of the toxic shock syndrome toxin, or TSST. This presents with fever, vomiting, rash, and shock. And what is the mechanism of this toxin? I hope you remember that it causes an activation of T-cells by causing nonspecific interaction between the T-cell receptor and the MHC class II molecules. This causes a massive release of vasoactive chemokines. And what's the classic history? Retained tampons or nasal packing. Don't miss it. Staph aureus can also cause scalded skin syndrome, which is mainly associated with babies in their newly cut umbilical cords, with less than sterile scissors. It is caused by the exotoxins of Staph aureus, known as exfoliatin. Exfoliatins are specific towards desmoglians in the epidermis. They break down the epidermal layer and cause a blistering of the skin, which resembles skin that has been scalded or burned. Remember that exfoliatins are made by the cell and actively secreted into the surroundings. Staph aureus is also the most common cause of bacterial endocarditis and osteomyelitis. Now what is the classic history that you're going to get on the boards in a patient with Staph aureus bacterial endocarditis? I'm thinking of a patient who has a strong history either by the history itself or by physical exam of IV drug abuse, sometimes abbreviated as IVDA, IV drug abuse. But what are some of those physical exam findings? They might not just flat out tell you history of drug use. They might say things like there are track marks on the skin, track marks or needle marks, or there's evidence of skin popping on exam. These are common findings in people with IV drug use. You'll learn more about this in the cardiology section. Staph epidermidis is our catalase positive, coagulase negative, gram positive coccus. Remember that staph epidermidis is normal flora found on your skin and can infect any external devices that penetrate the skin. This is why we swab the skin with alcohol wipes before collecting blood in the hospital, in an effort to kill staph epidermidis and prevent it from entering and contaminating the blood. The way you might be asked about this is you could be told that a blood culture from a patient has grown staph epidermidis. Does this mean that the patient has staph epidermidis bacteremia? No, not necessarily. It may just mean that some skin flora has contaminated the blood collection. This is also why blood cultures must be drawn from two separate sites 
of the body when they are ordered. So if that one of them gets contaminated and comes back positive, but the other one comes back negative, then you can pretty strongly say that it was likely to have been a contamination. You will hear about Staph epidermidis being a cause of infection related to prosthetic devices, including prosthetic valve related endocarditis. Empirically, you would treat such an infection with vancomycin until you have susceptibilities for the bug. Staph saprophyticus is our catalase positive, coagulase negative, gram positive coxes. Remember, these features are identical to Staph epidermidis. So wait a second, how do we tell these two bugs apart in the lab? I hope you remember from the discussion we just had about novobiosin. Which one was sensitive to novobiosin? Remember, at the staph retreat, there was no stress. So saprophyticus is resistant and epidermidis is sensitive. The key thing I want you to know about staph saprophyticus is that it is a very common cause of uncomplicated cystitis. In fact, it is the second most common cause behind which gram-negative rod? The answer, E. coli. Cystitis caused by Staph saprophyticus is often called honeymoon cystitis because of the relation to sexual activity. Which you can remember with the very college dorm room looking photo here. Time for a flash quiz. A 34 year old man develops nausea and vomiting four hours after an office potluck where he ate potato salad and a turkey sandwich. What is the most likely pathogen? The answer is Staphylococcus aureus, and remember that this bug has a preformed toxin that causes the symptoms of food poisoning. The key here is the types of food eaten, which usually are described as potato or macaroni salad. Again, things that have mayonnaise, and also the time course of four hours. Streptomoniae is our alpha hemolytic, gram-positive diplococci that is optican sensitive. Its capsule is one of its virulence factors. In fact, if it loses it, it won't be as virulent. Here you can see a fluorescent antibody stain of the diplococci. MOPS is a useful mnemonic for remembering the types of infections that strep pneumonia causes. Meningitis, otitis media, pneumonia, and sinusitis. Treatment is covered more thoroughly in the antimicrobial section. But what antibiotic do we commonly use to treat otitis media and sinusitis? Well, we are covering for gram-positive cocci, so we typically like to use amoxicillin or amoxicillin with clavulanic acid, often referred to as augmentin. Usually a 7 to 10 day course will suffice. You may remember from your micro courses that the cause of meningitis actually varies based on patient age. What is the most common cause in, say, an 18 to 60 year old adult? The answer is Neisseria meningitidis, but what about in kids or the elderly population? The answer is actually strep pneumo. You will definitely see some variation of this on your exam. So that's our discussion on meningitis for now, but what are the common signs and symptoms of pneumonia? This will be covered more extensively in the pulmonology section, but if you see fever and a cough that is productive of a rusty colored sputum, you might want to get a chest x-ray. Keep in mind that pneumonia will have a lobar consolidation on chest x-ray, and this is key to diagnosis. Consolidation patterns are also discussed more thoroughly in the pulmonology section. Viridin's group streptococci are alpha hemolytic optican resistant gram positive cocci. Remember, optican resistance is what distinguishes viridin strep from strep pneumonia. Do you remember the mnemonic? Overpass. Another useful mnemonic is that viridin's lives in the mouth because it is not afraid of the chin, which looks and sounds an awful lot like optican. The viridin's group of streptococci 
contain many species, all of which are alpha hemolytic. Viridin streptococci are normal flora found in the mouth. One species of viridin strep, Streptococcus mutans, is the bacteria in our mouth responsible for tooth cavities. When you eat a lot of sugar, strep mutans can convert that sucrose into lactic acid, creating an acidic environment in your mouth that makes it vulnerable to tooth decay. Viridin strep can also cause subacute bacterial endocarditis, sometimes referred to as SBE. A possible scenario is after a dental procedure when manipulation of the mouth with invasive tools can cause viridin strep to enter the bloodstream. This viridin strep can then travel through the blood and seed itself onto your heart valves. However, it only causes endocarditis in people who have pre-existing valvular disease, like from previous rheumatic heart disease. So if a patient with totally normal heart valves develops bacterial endocarditis, is it likely to be caused by strep viridans? No, probably not. The reason for this is that the viridans bacteria synthesize a glycocalyx composed of dextrans that can then adhere to fibrin, which is normally found at sites of endothelial trauma. Next, we'll talk about strep pyogenes, also known as group A strep, sometimes abbreviated as GAS. Remember, it is a beta-hemolytic, bacitracin-sensitive, gram-positive coccus. Do you remember what is the major virulence factor of strep pyogenes? That's right, it is M-protein. M-protein is antiphagocytic, so it prevents normal phagocytosis. The key disease you should know is that strep pyogenes causes pharyngitis, commonly known as strep throat. It can also cause skin infections too, like cellulitis or impetigo. A little pathology correlation coming at you. Pharyngitis from strep pyogenes has three important complications. Abscesses, either in the retropharyngeal or peritonsillar space, glomerulonephritis, and rheumatic fever. So once again, you can get abscess, glomerulonephritis, or rheumatic fever. However, it is important to remember that glomerulonephritis can occur after both pharyngitis or skin infections, whereas rheumatic fever will only occur after pharyngitis. Also important to know is that we treat pharyngitis with penicillin specifically to prevent these complications. It is important to give the penicillin early in the infection before the antibodies that mediate both rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis are made. This is why early detection and treatment of pharyngitis is crucial. Rheumatic fever is discussed in more detail in the cardiology chapter. Earlier, we talked about M protein being the virulence factor for strep pyogenes because it is antiphagocytic. Our immune systems, however, can produce antibodies against the M protein in an effort to fight the strep pyogenes infections. These antibodies are dangerous because they can cross-react against the same M protein found in cardiac muscle tissue, a phenomenon known as mimicry. Mimicry with M protein. This leads to damage of heart valves, such as the mitral valve, and can cause rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever is diagnosed with the Jones criteria. There is a great mnemonic that I like to use for the criteria, and they are Jones. Joints are affected, typically a polyarthritis. The O is represented by the heart, which signifies carditis. Remember, this can be endocarditis, myocarditis, or epicarditis. Any layer of the heart can be affected. Nodules can form, which are typically subcutaneous. Erythema marginatum and Sydenham chorea. Glomerulonephritis is another complication of strep pyogenes infections that you will learn about in the renal chapter. The last thing to remember about strep pyogenes is that its toxins can cause scarlet fever. One of the most striking features of scarlet fever is a sunburn type rash that starts on the neck or face and then spreads down the body. Scarlet fever is also associated with a strawberry tongue. When you learn about vasculitis, you'll learn about another disease that causes strawberry tongue. Can you tell me what that is? 
It's called Kawasaki disease. Strepagalactiae, or group B strep, are beta-hemolytic gram-positive cocci, distinguished from group A strep by the fact that they are bacitracin resistant. They are also positive on the hippurate test. You can think of the B in group B strep as standing for babies because everybody loves babies. Group B strep most commonly causes diseases such as pneumonia, meningitis, and sepsis in infants. Newborns usually acquire the pathogen via passage through a vaginal canal that has been colonized with the bacteria. Group B strep is normal flora in the genital tract of approximately a quarter of all women. Therefore, it is actually standard practice in the United States to screen all pregnant women at approximately 35 to 37 weeks of pregnancy. These women who have a positive culture will receive intrapartum penicillins a few hours before giving birth to prevent these serious complications. The Enterococcus genus of Streptococci possesses the group D Lansfield antigen and can grow under extremely harsh conditions, 6.5 sodium chloride and 40% bile salts solution, which is why they are able to survive as normal flora in the colon. This is in contrast to the non-enterococcal group D Streptococci species such as Strep bovis, which we'll discuss in another slide. Enterococcus faecalis and Enterococcus facium are clinically relevant, mostly causing diseases in hospitalized or immunocompromised patients. UTIs in catheterized patients, post-surgical peritonitis, and subacute bacterial endocarditis. These are all common infections caused by these two organisms. Vancomycin-resistant enterococci, or VRE, is an increasing problem in the hospital found in approximately 20% of Enterococcus facium isolates. You should know that strep bovis infections are very uncommon, but for some unknown reason it is associated with cancers of the GI tract. Therefore, if you ever see a patient who presents with blood cultures positive for strep bovis, you should suspect that this patient has a GI malignancy and perform the necessary workup, which is going to be ordering what test? I hope you're saying colonoscopy. And to remember this, use bovis in the blood, cancer in the colon as a handy mnemonic. Bovis in the blood, cancer in the colon. Time for another flash quiz. What are three clinical entities that can develop as a result of Streptococcus agalactiae infection in the newborn? The answer pneumonia, meningitis, and sepsis. Okay, now let's switch gears a bit and talk about gram-positive rods. Carinobacterium diphtheria is easy because it only causes one disease, diphtheria. Diphtheria used to be quite common, an upper respiratory infection characterized by fever, sore throat, lymphadenopathy, and an adherent gray-white pseudomembranous film covering the pharynx, tonsils, or nasal cavity. Other systems can also be affected, so you can see myocarditis and arrhythmias as well. Can you recall the mechanism of the exotoxin? In our basic micro lecture, we discussed that diphtheria toxin works by causing ADP ribosylation of elongation factor Two, thereby inhibiting protein synthesis. This fact is commonly tested on step one, so make sure to go back and review the mechanisms of exotoxins if you're feeling a bit shaky. Thanks to vaccination with the DTaP vaccine, a toxoid vaccine, diphtheria has largely been eradicated from industrialized populations. If diphtheria does appear on your step one, you probably will be dealing with a patient who has either missed some of their immunizations or is from a part of the world in which immunizations are less common. Treat for diphtheria with antitoxin as well as penicillin. 